All right, Friday night, we are both exhausted from a long day. Yeah, it, it, it was supposed to be a relatively easy day for me. Like if I looked at my calendar two days ago, it was actually pretty easy. And then I ended up with like, <laughs> it was oh, a full day. Totally. And you know, it's funny, sometimes I, I have appointments on my calendar and they get canceled and I don't take them off my calendar because it will fill up like that. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so, oh, it's tough. Yeah, but we're ready for the weekend and ready for Friday night and talk well, a little bit evidence-based triathlete you know it's awesome because you know it's the end of february and to me like this is the official start of like triathlon season when i really start to you know think about it triathlons are happening around the world mm -hmm. um you know even triathlons in the southwest are starting soon people are getting uh you know geared up for things mm -hmm. so you know the days are getting a little longer it's supposed to be getting warmer but it hasn't <laughs> been this week well i talked with someone uh at the pool today and we were both, you know, have spent time in Buffalo and he said, yeah, it's going to be like minus nine there this weekend. And I'm like, no, uh, not for me anymore. You know, this is cold. We're, yeah, we're what good. was it today? 40? <laughs> yeah, we're good. <laughs> yeah, 40 was terrible. But it's, it's so funny. This morning when I got up and I did a ride on the trainer, I, I looked outside. I'm like, oh, it's really sunny out. Maybe now nah, I'm going to stay inside. <laughs> right. But if I was in Canada, I would have ridden outside today. Oh, yeah. It would, it would have been a beautiful good. day. Yeah, it'd be a great day. Oh. So it's it's all it's all perspective for sure. Oh man, I tell you, but yeah, so we do got a good, we do have a good, we do got a good, yeah, we're, we do, we do have a good here in the Southwest, and you know, I I've, I've talked with you before that you know being in the Northeast and trying to train through the winter, you know, I could never really train truly until really April May, uh, and then it would open up and we'd start really getting a lot of training. And I remember always looking at you know, times in, you know, California or in the Southwest. And I'm like, how are these people getting so fast early in the season? Well, it's because they can train and we couldn't really train. And back then we didn't have a lot of indoor uh, capabilities like like our trainers we do now. So uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting, right? That'd be a little interesting for research studies to look at like power output from pre smart trainers mm -hmm. to now at like early season races. Well, you know, it's funny, one of the articles that we contemplated reviewing tonight was a big data article where they have scraped a lot of data from a lot of different uh, races yeah. and looking at how uh, people bonk and what the pattern is using this big data analytics tool. So I could see this being a big data analytics tool is, you know, scraping data from Zwift and Ruby and maybe well, matching Strava, I you know, right? yeah, Strava and somehow matching it up with race data uh I, there's got to be some way to do that i don't know but uh, that would be really neat to to put some machine learning to use there yeah oh for sure but then again i guess it's just retrospective because everyone has smart trainers now so that's really <laughs> right that's true oh. so, although that's what it used to be you know back in my day we used to train inside on rollers <laughs> <laughs> well that's what i that was actually my my big indoor training thing where roller and rollers you know back then you could attach a fan to a roller but it really didn't provide some good resistance and so we did a lot of roller work in the winter and no real resistance so you're really just working on spin technique which i think is really valuable but it's not like you know zwift or ruby or smart trainer yeah. It's interesting, you know, I, you know, in the winter do more training on the trainer and I do very little in the summer, but I was noticing, uh, my ride this morning that I'm like really low cadence on the trainer mm. and I don't know, like outdoors. I'm not like I, mm -hmm. my cadence outdoors is usually 80, 85 mm -hmm. on the trainer. I'm sitting around 70, 72. Interesting. And, but I don't know, like, and, and I tried to bump it up to 80. I'm like, Oh, that's not very comfortable, but outdoors. Oh, so yeah, we, had a, we had a student, uh, Jared Yoger did his thesis yeah. on uh, comparing cycling on a trainer versus cycling out outdoors. And he did it over in the parking lot of the Thomas and Mac. And uh, he had he took a trainer over and had people you know do a trainer ride at, at uh, some different wattages and then ride a loop. And I don't, oh boy, we, I wish we talked about it. Like, I'll have to, maybe I can pick it up uh, somewhere during. But there wasn't, there was, in my recollection, there wasn't many differences. No, but no, there was. But my theory is, is I've done 14,000 miles on Zwift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And so now, and, and I'm coming kind of the, the end of like the Zwift season for me. Mm -hmm. Right. And I did a bunch of racing this winter and 
I think that my body is just like, okay, you know, I can produce more power at a lower wattage or mm-hmm. lower, lower um, spin rate yeah. or cadence. And I've just, so like, cause I, you know, constantly looking at power output, especially when we're racing, um, constantly looking at power output. Yeah. And so I think that that's where I'm producing the highest amount of power, but it comes at a cost, right? Mm-hmm. But the Zwift races, the longest race I think I did this year was 55 minutes. Mm. Right. So it's not, and I didn't have to run off of that. Whereas, you know, like traditional triathlon training, like, or racing is it's longer than that. And I have to run after. And so the fatigue in my legs is quite, is, it would be quite different. Mm-hmm. I, uh-huh. and I, yeah, I, and I don't know. Okay. I got to do, I got to hand my phone off because we yeah, got a little it. bit of an emergency. So I'm going to do a phone hand off. off. So you uh, keep talk about this. <laughs> All right, you you hold the airways right. Now. So hold the airways. So yeah, this is a theoretical situation of like you know is what's what's making my cadence so low as uh, as I as I cycle indoors, and I really do think that it's it's because it's a short amount of time. I know I'm going to have to produce power, and I don't care how fatigued my muscle my musculature gets. But if I increase my cadence, my heart rate would go up. And I'm also aware of that. Like when my heart rate goes up and it, you know, gets up to like, for me, 160, 170, it becomes really uncomfortable. So if I do a lower cadence, keep my heart rate a little lower, but take the strain on my legs. Anyways, it's, it, there's, a, there's a lot of theories to why this happens. The other thing I notice in the winter, and, and I don't know if others do this as well, is I tend to get like more knee pain and like patella femoral issues. But I'm thinking it's probably due to the low cadence Mm. um and a higher torque on my knee um, yeah or a a higher muscle force demand because the lower the cadence so power is a function of force and how fast that force is being applied so it's force times velocity Mm -hmm. so if your power is still the same but now and so your velocity would be analogous to cadence yep so if you're going at a lower cadence but you're maintaining the same power even to more power your force has to be greater yep you're, and this would be your muscle force at this point. Yeah. And then, then, then ultimately torque on the joint. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And then, and stress on the tendons. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, you know, it's super interesting stuff. Like, you know, I get, I get patellofemoral issues from time to time. And the last time I, I really made it mad, I was in, uh, in Colorado in the summer mm-hmm. and I, I shouldn't have done it, but there was the day was the day to do the climb because the mm. next day was going to be too cold to go over 10,000 feet. And so mm-hmm. I think I did 11,000 feet of climbing in one day and it was too much for my knee at the time. And I, and I'm, it was pretty steep and I I'm sure it was the torque issue, right? I was in yeah. the lowest possible gear standing up and just probably cadence. I should look back. Probably my cadence was like 60 to 70 then, you know, for a lot of that time. Yeah, this is good. This is good for me, right? To recognize that I need to, you know, to avoid that. I need to actually increase my cadence. Mm-hmm. So you know, and, and pay attention for, to that. This is good. We're going down an interesting direction, though. That that is different than what we thought we yeah, would. We always do this. We we, uh, we should really do um, a, a, an episode on bike fitting and the physics behind it. And the the injury potential of having something you know not fit correctly. I'm not saying that you're not fit correctly, but because you're you know this all goes together in terms of cadence, torque, power, yep. setup, and and ultimately uh, injuries or injury prevention. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I've I've talked to some bike fitters and I've I've been fit. Mm-hmm. Um, there there. <laughs> You can't outfit a bad training, mm-hmm. yeah. bad training okay. plan. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So if we've talked about it before, ramp rate, right? So if your ramp rate is too great, yeah. it doesn't matter how good your fit is. Yeah. Right. And your ramp rate, we talked about just in general for fitness, but your ramp rate for your 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 tendons also play a role, right? Yeah. That's so great. if my ramp rate at an RPM of sixty five, mm-hmm. and you know pushing two hundred and forty watts for an hour that you know, no matter how much cycling I've done at 80 RPM at 200 Watts, it's mm-hmm. not going to translate over. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. Like I'm, I agree with you, but we should talk about fit, but 
it doesn't matter how good the fit is if, if the training program is poor. <laughs> that's right. No, that's totally true. So what's interesting, and now I'm going to try to steer it back to where we wanted to yep. go. It's amazing how much uh, people have spent time on the fit, not only for this reason, which I think we need to dedicate an episode to, but also for aerodynamics. Yep. And, you know, it's funny, actually, I was listening to uh, a different podcast uh, today, and they were talking about the Winter Olympics, which is just uh, coming to a close, and uh, how much technology has entered a lot of winter sports. And, and I think this is the same thing that's happened with triathlon here. We've talked about smart trainers, and now we're talking about bike fit, which is not only something someone does by eye, but there's all different types of tools to, uh, to determine bike fit what we think is a good bike fit. And that's a balance between this, you know, power generation, injury prevention, and aerodynamics. Yeah. And 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 you're you're right you're you're right on in, in winter sports, it's huge. It's obviously probably more prevalent in winter sports than summer sports because winter sports in general are done faster. Yeah. Yeah. Like skiing is fast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. bobsled is fast any of the sliding sports they're fast cross-country skiing is fast it's, it's, faster than, yeah. it's faster than running anything on the ice like your all your speed skating stuff mm-hmm. is done faster yeah um the winter olympics are the best to watch because you have the most carnage <laughs> how so well think about it in summer olympics other than cycling yeah i guess i maybe i guess trap on the part yeah. of cycling where are you actually going to see somebody crash and really hurt themselves? Uh, I don't know. You can see some good hamstrings being pulled during the. Yeah, but I'm saying like where there's actually like someone could die. Yeah, yeah, right. right. Like NASCAR style. That's true. Yeah. The Winter Olympics is man. It's like it seems like every almost every sport, like even figure skating, right? You're doing like quadruple yeah. jumps and like every single one of these sports yeah. is like they're on the freaking yeah. edge. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I don't know how how everyone is uh, remembers this, but you know the old uh, you know agony of defeat, agony of defeat, yeah, you know, clip of the guy coming down the the ski jump and and uh, bailing at the last second and you know just going off in all different directions. So. And if you look at ski jumping, that's a perfect example, right? It's actually not that dangerous. Well, okay, but traditional ski jumping, right? That's right, but I, actually, it's it really is not ski jumping. It's really ski falling. You're really yeah. trying to see who can fall the furthest. <laughs> the, the slowest and the furthest. It, you know, what's funny is, I, you know, being from New York, I went up to Lake Placid and during the summer uh, would go up to, not, not often, but, you know, go tour the, the Olympic Village and what have you. And the ski jump is there. And in the summer, they do jumps off there, but it's a special, you know, surface so that they can uh, still still practice. And you're able to stand right next to the jump area where they take off from the ramp. And I remember standing there watching someone come down and right about right before the person would take off, I'd say, yeah, I'd bail right about then. Because <laughs> you're just you're going you're falling into, you know, nothing and you're yep. seeing how far you can fall. <laughs> I but I, I, I still contend it's one of the safer sports now. Like you, I don't know if you how much you watch, but the big air. Yeah, yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh! Like the yeah. the the danger is just mm-hmm. so great. But that's why the Winter Olympics are fun for me. Fun to watch. I guess the only one that's not really dangerous is the curling. Oh. <laughs> but it depends on how many beers you've had. That's right. Because you know, I grew up in a curling culture, and it really the injuries came after a lot of drinking. Well, this is something I'm still got a little beef with my wife that we go up to Calgary and I kept saying, she'd say, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go curling and we've never gone curling. So, well, we're going to have to time our time when we go up there next yeah. time and uh, we'll go curling together. That's right. <laughs> we actually did curling in, in high school and in, in our PE class. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, that was, it, it's really, honestly, it's really hard. It's oh, yeah. Really yeah, hard. I bet. I bet. All right. Well, well, speaking of hard and difficult, <laughs> let's get it back to some triathlete talk and aerodynamics. And I think we're both a little punchy from a tough day. You know, so aerodynamics is uh, one of these key parameters that that influences each sport. We think of it really with cycling, and that's how we started this this talk. But it, it really shows up in each sport. And so uh, I don't know, you you would mention aerodynamics. Uh, where where were you thinking aerodynamics? Uh, well, when, when you I was met? thinking mostly from cycling, but honestly, I've been working with a new swim coach and we've been doing a ton of work on position and drag. Yep. And, and we've talked about drag in swimming before and we've talked about aerodynamics. 
but really I wanted to, to kind of like you're talking about go with it for all three sports, but you asked me, said, what's a hot topic in triathlon right yeah. now? And I, it keeps coming back of guys yeah. and girls mm-hmm. spending time in the wind tunnel and mm-hmm. coming up with really good, strong bike legs mm-hmm. on uh, not that much power. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, I can't think of anyone by name off the top of my head, but, you know, doing uh, a half Ironman and, and winning it at 300 watts for a pro. Yeah, right, right. Which is not much, mm-hmm. right? But but that tells you that you know, the position is just so dialed in and so low and they're getting their CDAs to ridiculously no, low numbers. Mm-hmm. And, they're, but they're, they're, and they're sacrificing power mm-hmm. for the position. Mm-hmm. And, and I've heard some interviews of these people and, and they, they say, yeah, that's, we're, we're doing that. We're, we're doing that. But guess what we're doing? We're running off of it as well. Yeah, that's because right. Because I didn't put out 350 watts. Mm-hmm. And my heart rate was lower. No. no. And if I put out 350 watts, maybe I go a little bit, fa- a little bit faster, mm-hmm. but then I run slower. Yeah, that's right. And so they're, they're, you know, they're thinking about triathlon and it's particularly this bike uh, run combo as um, a unit together mm-hmm. instead of, okay, well, how many watts can I generate on the bike? Right. Yeah. And that's going to get me from point A to point B as fast as I can. Mm-hmm. And instead they're thinking like, I'm going to go less Watts, be more aerodynamic, mm-hmm. give up a little bit, but then be able to run faster. Yep. No, that's that, that you're spot on it. And what's really neat is when we talk aerodynamics, it comes into play with the bike setup, the bike equipment, but it all, and also race tactics in terms of the draft zone. And there's, you know, this is the, the, the thing that you're talking about with the swim bike combo is you got to have a good swim, which you would have drafting there as well with, uh, to exit so that you can get in the same pack as somebody else or multiple people and have legal drafting because we know drafting is illegal, but there is legal drafting where you're still, you know, outside the, the zone, whatever it ends up being 12 meters or 20 meters. And you can still get a benefit, meaning that you can uh, bike at the same speed as someone in front of you, but at less cost. And yep. so it's, but it's still aerodynamics. It's still, it's going to be the same formula. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, John, you had the, you know, l- let's actually start talking about swimming and we'll go swim, bike, run. So you had the, those paddles that could, they were trying to measure power and you've done some power stuff with swimming. Some of my reading in triathletes is, that the triathletes mostly are putting out the same amount of power while swimming, Mm -hmm. but it's the technique and it's the position. And really it's the position that is, is, you know, the difference between someone swimming a little bit faster, a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. And then it's a slower person. If their position is not as good with their body, maybe their position in the race needs to be better, right? Like they need to Mm -hmm. follow the right person. And all of this is, is it's not aerodynamics, right? It's hydrodynamics, I guess, of this, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. It's the same formula. The same formula, but just yeah. But the medium is is, is more dense, and we've that's talked right. about that. we've All talked right, about so, that before. Yeah. So the formula that we're 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 actually going to talk, and this is why I call myself a biomechanist, because when you ask a question, I often think of an equation to be able to answer the question. And this, you know, context we're talking about how to go faster and swim, bike, and run. Immediately, the the drag force equation comes to mind and that's one half row CDA V squared. All right. So what, you got that memorized. Uh, uh, totally. We, I, so I, a lot of you don't know, John has a tattoo of that formula <laughs> on his forearm. So when he's biking, he looks at that. That's right. And okay, so here's the deal. It, well, I, I teach it. And so this is one of my, you know, mul- well, this is actually multiple lectures that I use the same equation over and over again and have multiple lectures on. One half is a constant row, which is a sort of a funny uh, P or you know, it looks like a P Greek letter row. CD, oh, oh, sorry, rho is how dense the fluid is that's moving over the object. And when we talk about drag, air drag, that air is considered a fluid, okay? So, and water obviously is a fluid, but it could be any fluid that we're talking about, you know, oil, anything that you can think of, that, that's, a, that's a fluid. So rho is the density of the fluid. Water is about 800 di- times more dense than air. That's why we, we tend to talk about drag forces being greater in the water than in the air. So one half row CD, 
coefficient of drag is a single number, and all that represents is how well the fluid moves over the object. There's a lot that actually goes into CD. There's different types of things in terms of how the fluid sticks to the surface or how much turbulence is, is uh, created by the fluid moving over the object. But in essence, it all boils down to how well the fluid moves over the object. So if you see a teardrop shape from the side, that fluid moves well over that really easily. So that's going to be a low CD, all right? Something that's even circular or boxy, <clears throat> the fluid would not move over and there'd be a lot of turbulence afterwards. We can also change CD uh, not only by shape, but like I said, the characteristics of the surface and how sticky the fluid and the, and the surface uh, are, how the stickiness of that. All right, so that's CD. Then A, one half row CDA, A is the frontal area. So if I'm looking at an object moving through a fluid, I have to look at the uh, front part, uh, looking as if the object's moving towards you. And then you just look at the area you see, you know, you outline everything you see, and that's the area. The bigger the area, the bigger the drag force. So one half row CDA, V squared. And V is how fast the fluid is moving over the object. Not how fast the object's going, how fast the fluid is moving the, over the object. All right, so now CD, we often say CDA, and, and you, you mentioned that. It's sometimes really hard to separate out CD and A from each other. You actually need some really good tools to be able to do that. So what, what will often happen is we'll combine those two terms and call it one term. We'll call it CDA. We'll just say it fast, and it's CDA. It's actually two things uh, together, but hard to experimentally separate out. So, okay, so now drag force. There is resistance drag force, which is what we're talking about, but then drag force can also be a propelling force. So you're biking in a, uh, with a big tailwind, that tailwind is pushing you, that's a propelling force. Swimming, I'm moving my hand through the water, uh, the water's trying to move over my hand, I'm pushing against the water, water's pushing back on me. That ends up being, from the hand perspective, a propelling drag force. So we call it a drag propulsion force. But what we're talking about mostly is the drag resistance force. All right, so that's it for the, the physics. One half rho CDA V squared. And so now you're talking position in the water. That actually is going to influence both how well the fluid moves over the swimmer as well as the frontal area of the swimmer. And so that would be combined, we would just say CD. So someone moving through the water with their feet dragging, I should have a little skeleton here, their feet dragging, that's going to decrease or that's, sorry, that's going to increase CD and it's going to increase A. So we would really talk about those together. Yeah. No, it, 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 this is like so important, right? Because I, I, and we've lamented many times about my poor swimming yeah. and uh, I, I keep trying things. I keep trying to get better. And, you know, and, and once again, I should be sponsored by form goggles. I'm not, but what I've been doing with this new coach is we've been trying thing, different things to change my, basically change my CDA mm -hmm. yep. and I'll do a 50. Right. And then I get instant feedback from my goggles. Okay. That 50 was 45 seconds. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's try this. You know, do it again. Oh, 44 seconds. Okay. Let's repeat it. Can I do it again? Same thing. Okay. 44 seconds with, I'm, and I'm taking big rest in between mm -hmm. so trying to keep things relatively constant. And then, okay, let's make another change. Next thing you know, Oh, I'm 42. That's mm -hmm. significant from the, the, the 45. And then if I would, which I haven't is like, if my heart rate is higher than that, not necessarily a, a win, but let's say I'm actually having a lower heart rate. And now I'm at 42. There's some good stuff happening there. And just, la just last night I was doing this and we're making all these changes. And I'm like, okay, that one I worked hard on. I did a 50 in 44. Yep. The next one, I actually didn't work nearly as hard. And it was a 44. Mm -hmm. That's a win. That's progress. That's yeah. a big progress. Now, mm -hmm. it doesn't always feel like that when we're when we're talking about uh, like sports like this. Mm -hmm. And it's the same. We'll get to on the bike. If you really power doesn't matter, it's how fast you get from A to B. Mm -hmm. And really, if you think about it, in all of these sports, swim, bike, and run, I want to put in the least amount of effort mm -hmm. 
to go the fastest I can go. Yep. Like, they don't give any prizes at the end of the, of the, of the Ironman saying, this person put out the most watts. That's right. Right? Or this person burned the most calories while swimming. Yeah. Right? Because the guy that wins definitely didn't burn the most calories. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, I'm trying to go this more scientific route mm -hmm. of trying to swim easier and mm -hmm. go the same speed or faster. Yeah. And it's really having to do with alterations, mostly in CDA. Mm hmm no, I love it. And I, and I, I've talked about that as well. And I do this myself is I, a lot of times I'm training my swimming fitness so that I can bike better. And I'm yeah. not necessarily trying to go faster. Yeah. I want, it'd be great to go faster, but you know, I know where I'm at and, and for me to, to, you know, drop a minute or two minutes off an iron distance swim, it's going to take so much time and effort, but if I can make it you know, so I'm fit enough and I've got the right technique and I exit that water and I'm just, you know, fresh and ready to go on the bike, then that's victory right there. Yeah. So I'll give you another little thing, a little example. So about a year and a half ago, I made the decision to go to a two beat kick. Yep. Cause I was like, you know what, if I can kick, um, you know, one third of what, you know, normally it was a six beat kick, one third of the amount of kicks, I am going to save energy for my run. Yep so my new coach is like hey we need to go back to a six feet kick oh <laughs> interesting but i but i but this coach i told i told him i said hey i will do whatever you say mm -hmm. like, you're the yeah, coach yeah. i'm the athlete i am 100 coachable yep okay so we go to a six feet kick and but it's a small six feet kick right, right and what ended up happening and at least what he tells me he sees is now my hips are higher mm-hmm mm -hmm. right so, and then I finish a 50 or a hundred and I'm actually not as fatigued as when yeah. I did the same Good. speed with a two beat kick. Yeah. Right. Because on the two beat kick, it was, and we talked about this with Rick, right? Like some people, if they're sinkers, they need a six beat kick. Mm -hmm. I'm obviously a sinker. Yeah, yeah. And so the six beat kick, even, even if it was, a, it was smaller, got me there as fast yeah. as before or faster, mm -hmm. but with less effort. Right which doesn't, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? Like you think, oh, I'm going to kick less, but now I'm pushing harder against more resistance. And, and what's in this is CDA stuff. Yeah, well, it is because, you know, if your legs are lower in the water and this being my legs here and you're moving through the water like this, that in essence is increasing your frontal area. So if you're looking at the palm of my hand versus like this, you've reduced your frontal area. So you've reduced CDA. And therefore, one half row CDAV squared. It's just math. It's uh, you're you're less drag resistance force. Yep. So then you need less force to go the same the speed. Propulsion force. That's right. To go to go the same speed or 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 even potentially faster. Exactly. So, so this is my new thing: is to is to become as hydrodynamic, yeah, uh, as, as possible. Because it, it always frustrated me because I feel like I'm fit. Yeah. Like cardiovascularly like yeah. i feel sure. like i'm fit mm -hmm. why am i always out of breath swimming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right because i'm working really hard and going nowhere yeah and it's and it really it, it's coming down to it it is it's drag right mm -hmm. oh totally and and so i had a student ask me this last week uh because we started in on swimming kinetics and you know the wetsuit issue and the student asked so does everybody swim faster with a wetsuit? And I was like, well, it, no, it depends on, everybody. on the swimmer. That's right. Uh, because it, the wetsuit can help out uh, certain swimmers, usually swimmers that are, are a bit slower because their, their lower body is drag or, or you know dipping deeper in the water and increasing both CDA. Whereas you put the wetsuit on that automatically pops you up into a more vertical position, reduces CDA. And now all of a sudden you're able to swim faster. Whereas a really good swimmer may only get a marginal difference of, of, uh, of a wetsuit because the A is not going to change. And so now you're really just getting the benefit of the, the wetsuit from a CD perspective because it's smoother and the fluid moves over that surface uh, easierly. So you end up having just a smaller impact uh, of the wetsuit. I would have answered just in a little different. I'd said at a certain temperature, everyone is faster in a wetsuit. <laughs> at a certain temperature yeah around 40 degrees 
Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. Everybody's right. faster than a wetsuit. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're you're not swimming very fast in in or you're not swimming very long in forty degree water. That's for exactly sure. exactly. So we're talking uh, Fahrenheit was, now, right? Not Celsius. Yeah, we're, talking, we're talking Fahrenheit. <laughs> okay. Or forty degrees uh, Celsius also would be a problem. Yeah, they don't want to put the wetsuit on then. <laughs> So no one would be swimming faster in a wetsuit. <laughs> and we've actually done some work on this. I'll just uh, throw this in. Yep. Um, we actually did look at uh, what happens when you wear a wetsuit in warmer water. And what is interesting, uh, it, it's exactly as what we all know. You end up swimming slower, but your core temperature, with the, what we demonstrated, core temperature didn't change. Yep. And so really they're picking the speed you know, because that's going to be caloric cost and that caloric cost is going to increase the, the heat within you. It's almost as if people were picking a speed to not let core temperature go up, even in the warmer yeah. water. So you just swim slower. Yep. Well, it's, but think about it when you run and it's hot, mm -hmm. you run slower. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's not because you want to run slower. You just naturally do because you, your body says, I don't want my core temperature yeah. to increase now. And for short amount of times that works, right. And same in the swimming. But obviously, we've had people die of mm -hmm. hyper, hyperthermia mm -hmm. in wetsuits, or not in wetsuits, in, in open water swimming when it's been hot, like yeah, the long, yeah. long distance, yeah. because eventually you can't, keep, you just can't keep up. That's right. And, and Frank Kippen was the main uh, athlete who died in the warm yeah. water, and, and he was not wearing a wetsuit, and yeah. the water was just so warm that it's uh, hard to get rid of the heat in, uh, from the body. And this is why marathons are usually, you know, competitive marathons are usually in the fall or spring, you know, in, in climates that that's uh, cooler. Yeah. Okay, so I think we've got a pretty good take there on swimming and how important- All right, well, let's go in, you know, the the, the importance of the wetsuit oh, okay. yeah. for C, D, and A. And that is, uh, that's why a lot of us swim faster. And I swim faster with a wetsuit. Uh, and even, you know, your cap, is going to be a uh, part of CDA and uh, you know you're you're working on technique not only your kicking uh, cadence but also your ankle flexibility uh, we we had a swimmer in in college who was really a triathlete and he just joined the swim team so he'd get better at swimming when he did just a kick drill he'd actually go the wrong direction he'd go backwards because his ankles were so inflexible as he was uh, kicking down in the water he was actually creating a force that would pull him backwards. So ankle flexibility is an issue. I think I told you this, but like, I always do my first thousand with fins on. Okay. And yeah, yeah. my reason is to work on the flexibility because oftentimes yeah. I've done something that day. I've either ran or biked yeah. and I feel like I need that to like loosen my, my ankles mm. up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember there was some, some swim guru. This was like their thing, like with triathletes, they, it was a kind of a little tip. Yeah. Uh, for if the if ankle flexibility was an issue. Yep. No, that's true. Now I'm going to read from the comments too, because this is related to that. Uh, well, Matt says he volunteers for the bike fit. Colleen says, does skin have a bad CD in the drag equation? Well, skin, if you, if you shave all the hair, you can actually put some other um, lotions on to reduce the CD, but there are some better fabrics that uh, have a lower CD than skin. And this is why the you know swim skins, uh, even for competitive swimming, became super popular. And even for both men and women, they were wearing these full suits because the the, the fabric had a, a, a more of a hydrophobic, a, a lower CD than even bare skin did. Yep. Yeah, great question. Yeah, and we're seeing that in, in cycling as well, right? And, yeah. And yep. people wearing long sleeve mm -hmm. um, cycling tops and. You know, the one thing I'll, I'll, I'll add to that is in cycling in particular, it's a, there's a balance between um, maybe a little bit less drag with clothing mm -hmm. and temperature regulation. Yep. Right? Now, if you put stuff on top of you, it's going to be an insulator. Yep, that's right. And, and, and I'll offer also, if we get to a point where the water is warm enough and you can't wear a wetsuit, if you're wearing something of some type of fabric, don't just wear your tri suit unless your tri suit is built for you know swimming. Yeah. There's a lot of tri kits out there that don't take swimming into account and that they're expecting you to wear under a wetsuit. So that's why a lot, a lot of times for especially for longer races, you wear a swim skin, which is a special fabric, 
then you change out of that uh, into your tri kit for for biking. A tri kit by itself, I, I would not compete even in a sprint in a tri kit because the the jersey itself is usually not uh, a fabric that is hydrophobic and will increase uh, CD and make you slower. Yep. And same thing with the shorts too. Uh, you get you get you, you got to pick the right gear especially if it's a non-wetsuit if it's a non if it's a wetsuit swim wear whatever you want under the the wetsuit and then you take the wetsuit off and you're good to go on the bike but uh the the you do need to be careful what you're swimming in if it's a if it's not a wetsuit yep agreed and then i i you did mention it but like some of the wetsuits especially some of the newer wetsuits are coming out with supposedly more and more um hydrodynamic mm -hmm. um, surfaces right and you know it's this is an interesting one and i know you've done some work with with hoob on some of their stuff but this is this is some to me some really cool stuff but really difficult to test yeah it, for i'm sorry for i i just read bob's comment real quick our tri, our club tri suits and i i don't know um bob yet which uh tri suit uh it is um it it if it's if it's a tri skin, if it's a skin suit, then definitely for swimming. If it's a tri suit, it may or may not be uh, great for swimming. We'll have to see. I, I don't know which, um, there's a couple, it's the two piece kit and then there's the one piece kit. And it's just a matter of looking at the uh, that at the fabric. So sorry, Ted. I, no, it's okay. I I was just talking about the material, or sorry, the, the hydrodynamics of wetsuits and I guess what I'm getting at is manufacturer claims versus mm -hmm. reality. Yeah, and, and that's a really hard thing, I think, to 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 actually study and to prove. Yeah. Like this suit is four percent more hydrodynamic than this suit. Well, maybe in this one racer mm -hmm. that they tested, or a few people, but the average person, who knows? Like you know, this is a, it. It depends. Oh, totally. And and yeah, when I did some work with uh, with who uh, designed, uh, we. Man, we had to go to Mallorca, Spain. It was so terrible. <laughs> and, oh, those were the good old days. That's right. Yeah, they are totally. And the equipment we used was basically a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment to measure drag force, and so the, that's not accessible to anyone else. Now, yes, you could do some different things in the pool, swim a hundred you know yards or meters, whatever, and then try something else. But still, there's a margin of error you know, even yeah. within that. I I think the surface of your, like, let's say you have a ribbing or something that's supposed to be hydrodynamic. Yeah. And you put one wetsuit on, swim a couple hundreds, another wetsuit on, swim a couple hundreds. The noise would be too great, right? That's like, right. that's right. Like, Cause it's probably 1% difference mm -hmm. in, in a hundred, even a 200. Uh, is that going to be something you, you, you know, I mean, honestly, for me, that's like one bad push off a wall. No, that's right. Or, or one, you know, you're going to go turning you know, yep. around and, and you get caught into other people. No, that 1% is, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a tough number. Yep. Uh, and, and even, you know, you can probably improve your swimming dramatically by learning to sight and swim straight versus uh, zigzagging and losing your way yep. along the way. So. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. So should we move on to bike? Let's move on to bike. All right. So would you rather be more power powerful? Or more aerodynamic. Oh well. well you had to choose. So today, well, I can okay. make ten percent more powerful or ten percent more aerodynamic. Ooh, this is a bio. Oh. This is a oh. biomechanics question that you should be asking your students. It's a, it, this is an optimization problem. So, all right. So, drag force during cycling. The equation. Can I test you? Do you know the equation now? <laughs> one half rho. rho one half rho C D C D A B squared. squared. Yeah. So yeah. So the challenge is, is that as you go faster, that drag force goes up. So it's uh, and it goes up exponentially. And so this is always a funny thing. And remember, you you helped me out when we were looking at Indian Wells, and uh, we were looking at predicted times. And because Indian Wells is so flat, uh, the amount of change in uh, time for a given, you know, power increase was not that great. And that's because drag force is V squared. So you've got to put out a lot more power to go uh, that much faster. And so it, it, that the speed issue is a exponential problem. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know, 10%, I'll have to do the math right now. Well, it would depend. It would depend on how fast you're going. Yeah, yeah, that's right. right. So if you're going 10 miles an hour versus mm -hmm. 
yeah. 30 miles an hour. Yeah. You know, at 30 miles an hour, I'm pretty sure I would take 10% more aerodynamics. I think you're at right. 10 right. miles an hour, I'm pretty sure I'd take 10% more power. That's right. That's probably not so gonna it is an, it's an interesting thing, right? So with, with higher level triathletes, your pro triathletes, for example, they're typically cycling 25 to 30 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And so for, for, for that speed aerodynamics, because you were, you, you, because of the formula we're talking about, because it's, it, it's an exponential that becomes way more important, yep. right? Whereas if you're an age grouper and let's say you're going 18 to 20 miles an hour, it's actually not as important. That's right. Mm -hmm. not, not that it, not that it's not important, mm -hmm. but the difference is, is going to be, is going to be less. Would you agree? Oh, totally. And, and this is where we need to be careful of some of the marketing techniques exactly. that companies use is because a lot of times the standard for testing for uh, aerodynamic effect is like 30 miles per hour. Yeah. It's like no one's going, uh, we're not going 30, maybe a oh, different we will, part. We will the downhills, right? That's right. That's right. But if you're doing Indian Wells or some course that's flat like that, that is just not, uh, that's not going to come into play, uh, at least for me. <laughs> well, I've always said that based off of the marketing claims of the, of the stuff that I have yeah. on my bike, I should be, uh, I should be going 35 miles an hour, easy, yeah. average power, because everything, yeah. well, this is going to increase by 10% and this is going to yeah, yeah. increase this by this. And yeah. It's I not, should be way faster than I am. Yeah. It, it doesn't always, one and one doesn't, does not always make two. So yeah. <laughs> So, so getting back to the whole thing of optimizing aerodynamics, it does depend on speed, mm -hmm. but still it, it's, it's really an important thing. And, you know, you and I, have, we've raced a ton and we've seen a lot of really good aerodynamic positions mm -hmm. and setups yeah, yeah. and some really bad ones. Yeah. That's and right. I kind of feel like, I don't know, I feel bad for people that have stuff hanging off their bikes mm -hmm. and. I don't know, like just whatever the, you know, loose fitting clothes when they don't mm -hmm. need to, you know, big open uh, air helmets. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just like, Oh my gosh. Like, but then they run a disc wheel. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's like, that is such a small game. Arrow compared socks. To, yeah. yeah. Compared to all of yeah. these, these things. And, you know, when I get ready for a race or when I mentally prepare for things, my number one is, on my bike is aerodynamics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How can I become a little bit more aero? Right. You know, and, and, and it's amazing. Like even you, you mentioned circular things. Like I was reading something about the shape of your straw on your between the arrow oh, totally. yeah, yeah. water bottle. Like that, you know, if it's an, if it's round, it's, yeah. it's not as good as if it's oval. Round is bad. Round is bad. Right. Well, what shape are my arrow bars? Oh, there's my bike right there. They're round. <laughs> yeah, you gotta That's dumb. That. That's Come dumb. On. Come on, rookie. Come on. Well, All right, I've... but here I got to I got to catch up with Bob's comment here because this is an excellent comment right with us. So, and he's and I'm going to read it. So, for us slow folks, it is more effective to be fit, bike fit, for power than aerodynamics. Okay, and I can I'll, I'll I'll say I'm slow now too. You know, in terms of context, and um, it's sort of a balance. You can't you can't. You know, one of the benefits of being aerodynamic, even if you're doing 16, 18 miles per hour, or even, you know, 12, miles, whatever it is, is that your whatever power you are generating is uh, going to help you go faster or maintain a speed with less effort. And so the but the slower you go, like, obviously, if you're stopped, aerodynamics doesn't matter. But as you start going up, it just goes up V squared. It goes up exponentially. And, you know, it, it really, you know, starts to play a bigger role when you're starting 18, 20 miles per hour or even faster Then it really starts to take off because it's an exponential uh, figure. So I would say still work on your aerodynamics, no matter what speed you intend to go. But if you're going really fast, you've got to be really dialed in on aerodynamics. Yeah. Well, I'm going to add one more piece. And, and, and it's important piece is you talked about it's the speed of the fluid going over you. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Right. So how much time do you spend in a headwind when you're racing? Yeah, that's right. About half of the time, usually. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So you, let's say now you're going 15 miles an hour and you have a 50 mile an hour headwind. Mm -hmm. Fluid's moving across you at 30 miles an hour. That's right. And that's where aerodynamics becomes even more important. And, and John, I don't know about you, but when I race, 
I want to know where the headwinds are going to be. Oh, that, that's right. No, yeah. And, and, and there is, there, there are obviously ways to do this with like weather stuff and windsock and there's mm-hmm. different apps that we can use. Um, because I want to know, like during that time, I need to, you can feel it obviously, mm-hmm. but um, that's the time where I focus. Like yeah. if I'm into a headwind, man, I am, ultra focused on finding every little piece mm-hmm. i'll lower my power like i yeah. if i have to i'll lower my power so i can become more and more aerodynamic because i think there is a definite cost benefit ratio here that needs to be played out in racing and, and obviously in training too yeah no that that's a great 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 point because it, it's not your land speed and that that was the mistake i even made in saying going this speed or that speed it's how fast that fluid, the air is moving over you. And so, um, yeah, back, you know, we're, along with, with Bob's point, this is where you really want to work on a position because your position is probably one of the biggest factors that's going to influence your aerodynamics when you're going into a, a headwind. But you can't have a position that you can't sustain. That's right. absolutely no good at that point because even if you can get most aerodynamic for, you know, a minute or so, mm-hmm. That's not going to help you in a you know six hour seven hour ride because you won't be able to sustain that position. So, but if you can do it for a half an hour, yep, that's right. And you're into the headwind. That's right. It's very beneficial. And then when you're in, you got a big tailwind. You want to get a little bit more comfortable. Sit up a little bit. It's Mm -hmm. it's not going to penalize you, or if it does, it doesn't penalize you nearly as much. No, totally. For a while, uh, a number of years ago, for sprint races, I would take a couple of spacers out of my. Uh, head tube to drop my aero bars down lower because I could be more aerodynamic and so you know it's a half hour ride and then for that's why um, you beat me on those races <laughs> but then for a longer ride I put the spacers back in because I wanted to be a little bit more comfortable for longer and I'd suffer you know a little bit uh, uh, increase in CDA uh, based on that so what's interesting is remember when we did the um, the work with the aerodynamic measuring tool yeah which I dropped and broke <laughs> a $10,000 piece of equipment. Yeah, that was it. And, and the best uh, part is I'll share this with everybody. It was not even on the road. It was just in the no. office. I was you so, can understand if it fell off your bike. I was so excited to show Ted this, uh, this instrument. I pull it out of its case. I'm, we're in, in my office and I just fumbled it. And you I can said, laugh about it now. This is $10,000. <laughs> Boom. Crack. Well, it was, yeah. And, Fortunately, we're beta testing it. So, you know, the good thing is we were able to report back to the manufacturer that it was not durable enough. <laughs> well, when you drop it, from we two tested feet, that two, out two feet onto the tile floor. It yeah. Breaks, that's not very, yeah, that's not going to be really good right. in the real world. But anyways, yes, I laugh. I do remember, about it now, that. But I, I do remember I, working I was, with them. Yeah. OK, so what was really neat about that work. So we put a device on our bikes and we were biking outside and we were able to measure CD, which was it really was CDA, but we were able to measure uh, that component of the drag force using this special equipment. And what's really interesting is, and it really didn't strike me until then, is CD is not just CDA is not just from the front. It's not just your when you're looking head on into the cyclist that a because the wind is hitting at you from all these different angles, and we talk about yaw angle. When we start, you know, if you start reading up on CDA uh, and cycling, you're here, y'all. And that's just the angle that the wind is coming in at you. And it could come in at a crosswind. Well, then what you need to do is look at your CDA from the perspective of that direction that that wind's hitting you. So it's no longer just hitting you from the front. And this is partly why the helmets have really changed uh, how they're designed in that they're not just designed to take on a headwind they're designed to take on wind from a variety of different angles and same thing with the wheels the wheels are no longer just designed for a headwind they're really designed for a range of directions that the winds are hitting to have the lowest cda overall over a, a composite a, a, a number of different uh wind angles you know the thing that i thought was interesting in that testing that i still think of is if we moved our head so we were doing like if we were doing like a five minute test, yeah. if you moved your head to like, look just to the yeah. left, to the right, you could see it, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Um, we could see even like, if you moved your hand and shifted big, yeah. you mm-hmm. could see it in the data. And to me, that was like really interesting. Like, w- did it make a difference in the run speed? Mm-hmm. Not really, but it was enough to, to measure. Yeah. And 
So that tells me like, you know, when you're in a triathlon and you just sit up for a couple mm-hmm. seconds, it, it's there, like it, mm-hmm. it, it will slow you down. And um, now that being said, I'm going to preface this. There are times you need to sit up in a triathlon for safety. Okay. okay. So, so you better sit up, mm-hmm. but just to sit up, to sit up, if you don't have to, mm-hmm. is there is, there, there's seconds being lost every time you sit up mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and, and they, they add up. No, totally. And, and that's why I think even, you know, thinking about when you drink, pull your bottle up yeah. or when you eat, if you have to sit up, you do that. Uh, at times that you're not going to influence your CD, your drag force overall, yep. you're going to influence your CDA by changing your posture. But now you just got to think about the fluid moving over you. And obviously, if it's a little bit of a tailwind, that might be a time to, or you're going slower. Those are times to actually sit up because the, the drag force won't be a, as big of an issue at that point. Yeah. So like, you know, uh, Oceanside is on my mind because that's yep. the next next race mm-hmm. there are times there where you're going to be going real, relatively slow mm-hmm. because of the climbs right well that's a time to eat yeah right now you'll see people that that's a time to stand up and crush power which mm-hmm. is fine mm-hmm. but i look at that more of like oh, okay let me eat and then i'll stand up and crush some power maybe yeah. but because you're moving so slow the penalty for sitting up is is basically negligible on yeah. some of those in some of those climbs no right? true then I think of the last 10 miles of that race. Like to me, the, la- that, the last 10 miles of that race on the bike are the most critical of the whole thing. And everyone worries about the hill, mm-hmm. but the last 10 miles of that race is always into a headwind. Mm-hmm. It's a valley. That's right. That's right. At, at one to two percent down. Mm-hmm. So I was looking at some of my speeds uh, from when I raced there before, and I'm like 28 miles an hour mm-hmm. in, into because I'm going downhill, but into a headwind. Yeah. So the, so the fluid going over me might be 40 miles an hour for like, and it's like, a, it could be like, a, I think it's like 20 minutes to a half an hour. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be eating. Yeah. Right. Minute time. I don't want to sit up. I mm-hmm. want to be as small as I possibly can. And I know when I make that right hand turn that it's all about aerodynamics for the next 20 minutes. And I need to focus, focus, focus on the aerodynamics because mm-hmm. the penalty at 40 miles an hour I mean, literally lifting your head up an inch can, can drop you a mile an hour before you know, like quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, but knowing race courses, like it's nice when you've done race courses before and you know, prevailing wind and you know, Mm -hmm. situations like that. But I think that uh, a lot of triathletes don't think about those pieces Mm -hmm. or where the prevailing wind is. Even when we were getting ready for uh, the the Ironman in um, California, that never happened. And we're, forecast that 40 mile an hour winds yeah. i'd already planned on okay during this section of this piece if it's coming from there i need to just not eat not drink just stay as arrow as possible and then as, I, as soon as i turn around i'm going to sit up and get a 40 mm-hmm. mile an hour tailwind yeah. and eat all i want it's gonna be a rolling buffet for the next 20 minutes mm-hmm. and relax my body but knowing that stuff i think is 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 as important as knowing where the hills are and where the climbs are, yeah. the climbs are the, what they are. They're an opportunity to sit up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. No, that's great. And yeah, Bob even mentioned in his comment that yeah, eat more climbing and you have to, to a certain extent, not, you know, not when you're, when you're going up. Or, eat, or eat with tailwinds, right? Yeah. 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 No, Cause, totally. Cause even at Indian Wells, when you guys were down there and it was a dead flat course, there was nowhere really to like say, I'm going to oh, eat. Right because of, of a climb, but there were tailwinds for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. No. So let's talk about um, things that you can do to reduce uh, your drag resistance for a certain cycling. Obviously, we talked about position. We mentioned wheels, the frame set. Uh, what else do you look at for uh, aerodynamics? Yeah, this is, this is such a good question. So in listening to some of these podcasts of some of these pros that are going through this, one of the things that they've been mentioning is looking at your speedometer, mm. not the power. Yeah, yeah, right. Like, I know this section of road, or they're going back and forth on a section of road, right? And they're testing themselves. So let's say they have a two, two mile section mm-hmm. and they do it one time and they're like, okay, I'm 25 miles an hour. I make a little change, kind of, we're talking about the pool. Yeah. Right. Oh, now I'm 26 miles an hour. 
And that's a tangible difference, especially mm -hmm. if like hypothetically, let's say they work in the power as well. The power is okay. the same, they're going faster, right? So I think doing self-testing is important. Yeah. Um, for me personally, um, when I'm on the bike, I know I'm in a good position when I'm feeling the air on my back. Okay, yeah. Like when I get to that right position, I can actually feel the, I, I don't want to say it's a laminar flow. Yeah, order. not hitting your chest. You don't want your shirt ballooning up. It's yeah. not even really hitting my shoulders anymore, right? It's actually kind of going over me yeah. and I'm feeling that on my back, that's mm -hmm. a good sign for me. Yep. Um, the other one that I was historically bad with, on, and this is position, I guess, but it's not like fitting position, but I used to ride more with my knees out. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. That's so a good thing about mm -hmm. if your knees are out, your A is going to be that's right. going to be bigger. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually just thinking about this the other day when I was when I was riding. It was a downhill, and I was like, you know, what? is is am I better with? And this is maybe a good question for you. Am I better if I'm going downhill and not pedaling with one leg up and one leg down, mm -hmm. both legs mm -hmm. together? Yeah, yeah. What's what's more aerodynamic? Well, whichever one's going to reduce CDA more. <laughs> well, and theoretically, I guess would be the two two up. I, I don't know off the top I, of my head because I don't it, know if one it a will be different, but the C D may offset. So I don't I don't know. Yeah. I'd have to go look up the data on that. I'm sure someone's done that wind tunnel sure testing. I'm sure someone's done that before as well. And mm -hmm. then I started thinking, okay, well, in the Tour de France, they know all this stuff because they've yeah, done yeah. all the data. Right. You always see them like in these arrow tucks with their feet level. Yep, that's true. Even on corners, they'll mm -hmm. keep their feet level. So I'm like, okay, it's gotta be that position but then i start thinking if i'm in a triathlon and i want to feel like i need to stretch out a leg or something yeah. you know i maybe i don't want that flex position because once again i need to get ready for mm -hmm. you know, a run or whatever but like these are the things that go through my head when i'm riding yeah like, oh, i love especially it especially when i'm working on arrow um the other one i was doing when i was getting ready for ironman in california because i knew it was going to be so long in the arrow because it was a dead flat five hour right mm -hmm. So I was actually changing my hand position. Mm -hmm. so my hands were like on the arrow bars versus if I was wedging them in between the arrow bars. Mm -hmm. Not as safe. Yeah. Or, or, okay, put one hand between the arrow bars, the other hand on the arrow bar. Right, right. And I'm just messing around with little things like that and seeing if I could, you know, yeah. number one, be comfortable, but number two, just thinking about, can I get my area smaller? Yep, area smaller or CD again, and that, and again, that's why we call it CD yeah, it, because it's going to be a little bit of both. And Bob adds a really good comment here relative to your your previous point on up down is crank length, and that and this is something people have been talking about. If you go short of crank, maybe that reduces the aerodynamic drag force because it's reducing a because you're you're not going as deep in the pedal stroke, but then. On the other hand, uh, <laughs> and you can be lower. That's right. You have shorter cranks. You can actually be lower right. because, yeah, because the top end of your spindle. It, it, yeah, right. So you know, I went to one sixty five, one sixties, one six. I can't remember now. One sixty fives, I think, mm -hmm. uh, on my on my time trial bike, and that was a lot of it. Was yeah. if I can once again just get a little bit more aerodynamic. Mm -hmm. um so i look at i look at those things you know i think for we have you know you and i have you know pretty much integrated bikes yeah but i also look at cables mm -hmm. cables are horrible right because they're mm -hmm. round and so if you can hide cables mm -hmm. tape cables get them just get them so they're not in the wind yeah that is a that's an easy that's an easy win for well, you, you and i noticed that i forget which race we were at but we noticed that a lot of pros were taping their uh, between the bar uh, bottle, uh, taping it in a way that almost was a fairing, like an almost a way to uh, let the air, so a fairing is like on a motorcycle, you see a fairing, that, that uh, plexiglass. Like a shield. Fairing, a shield, right. That's gonna influence CD and A, but it will most likely uh, reduce CD. And so, yeah, so after we, we saw that, I actually started taping my uh, bottle me too. So that I didn't have any gaps between the bottle and the frame and the air, you know, moved over it easier. So anything you can do to reduce CD, more, we're at an hour now. Can you believe it? I knew we would go on. I know. You know. So anything on cycling, you can reduce CD or A, 
or combination of so nothing loose you know no loose fitting clothing everything should be tight uh shoes you know shoes you choose socks uh you choose um where you put your water bottles uh you and, and if you don't if you don't need a water bottle on your frame no, that's probably one. good not to but um you got to put that that you got to be able to carry your hydration and your your calories somewhere uh so it i never i never race with a a, a a bottle on my frame yeah right it's one behind me and one with my arms mm -hmm. yeah. trying to hide i'm trying to hide them yeah yeah and, that's right. yeah and so like you like you said like all of these little things that you mentioned the, if it's a little bit here a little bit there but remember the faster you go mm -hmm. or the faster the air is flowing over you the more is the the more the influence is going to occur yep all right so bob says one more question what about an aerodynamic hydro uh, pack backpack and uh, i think this is a part that we're missing right now in our gear now technically your uh if you wear your camelback um you want to wear it on the front <laughs> believe it or not you want the bladder in front of you in you fact fill up that space that's right you want to you don't want and then and, and almost ends up being a fairing and helping moving that air around you but no one wears it unless i think it was one of the tour de france riders was he had the bladder in his jersey and he didn't have fluid in it he pumped it up with air to make it uh make his torso which is illegal <laughs> not in triathlon it's not illegal no, no, I think we have to pump up the bladder over there then. But, but it, I, it brings up a good point, right? So yep. on some people having a hump on the back mm -hmm. might actually be beneficial. Yep. Right? Well, and however their airflow is coming off of their head. That's right. And and so I I actually uh, have used for hotter, warmer, humid races, I will wear a camelback that's a little bit more streamlined because my sweat rate's so high that I want to make sure to have enough fluid and I'll pay a bigger price if I don't stay hydrated. Yep. And so that this is one of those cost benefit types of things as well. So yeah, no, great question. So my thought on that one would be, is it insulating heat in and making yeah, it? Sweat? Yeah, that's right. That, right. So there's a balance. I, like, this is all balance. Yeah, I was talking with a, a person who has expertise in thermal regulations. That's exactly what he said too. He says, yeah, but you're going to retain all that heat. <laughs> Now during training, uh, you know, especially here in Las Vegas, I always bike with a camelback in the summer. I don't even own Just, one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess in talking about the thermodynamics, um, it could act as a heat sink as well if it was really it cool. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's why we're, we, I don't think we've seen the technology advance in, yeah. uh, in that area to, to, uh, to help. So it'll be interesting to see if we get some products out in that. Well, John, we covered a lot. We have. We, could, we didn't get to running. Get running. Okay. Well, we'll get running. Drag force. I'll be thinking about it in the half marathon on Sunday. Oh, you're running it. Well, I don't know if we're going to call it running. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be working the start line. I, so. Oh, the start line. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll be running at that point. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully not where I will be because uh, you'll be running into a lot of people because <laughs> I'll be behind the start line. Not okay. <laughs> okay. You're not the you. You get firing the gun. No, no. I'm just trying to help people not kill each other in the beginning. Just organize their paces. So I haven't ran further than 10k in okay. five months, four months. Okay. Well, that's good. You're running though. That's good. Well, it's not pain free, no. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to go. Uh, I paid my 99 bucks, so I got to get uh, at least get the T-shirt. Yeah. And uh, we'll see. Uh, it might be a run walk at the end, but we'll see. Well, um, uh, dress warm then. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm hoping it's supposed, Sunday is supposed to be a little nicer. So I'm I hoping so. it's going to be yeah. mile that race you mean, because it's at night and it's cold is the finish. Like once yeah. you once yeah. you finish, you get cold so right. fast. I've been yeah. almost hypothermic at the finish. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. No, that, that is a problem. Uh, yep. and that's why they usually held, hand you those mylar blankets afterwards. It does, a, little, it does a little. <laughs> they are. They are little. And it's. Yeah, that, that's sometimes the worst part is when you stop exercising and all of a sudden you're not generating all that heat. So. Yeah. And you're wet. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, this has been fun. One half yep. row CDA. One v half row squared. CDA V squared. I got there it. Go. I'm going to tattoo it on my arm so I can see it too. <laughs> I love it. All right. And thanks right. everybody for uh, the comments. That was great. Yeah. Our, our normal fans. Awesome. All right. Have a good weekend. Yeah, you too.